The following content has been provided by RWTH Aachen University. So let's start with HCI design patterns. So first of all, this is a topic where I basically step into large footsteps because this is kind of the, or this is a topic where Professor Borges, has, as far as I'm informed about, at least wrote a, book, wrote a book about, and I think he also did his PhD thesis on HCI design patterns. So he knows a lot about it, but I hope I can at least introduce the topic accordingly. Okay, so let's start with something to wake you up <laughs> a little bit. So let's see this picture here. Um, assuming that first of all, um, you are tasked with um, setting up the elevators in a building where you walk in and you are kind of, the person responsible for that the elevators actually do work correctly, have a good, let's say, user interface and everything. And uh, you now basically um, uh, pay some people to put in the buttons in your elevator. And you just tell them, yeah, I just, uh, just uh, put in the buttons in the elevator correctly. And this is the thing that you are then presented with. What is an issue here? Yeah, I guess in general, the, the order of the buttons is very weird. Mm -hmm. in, and yeah. the, the biggest issue I think is where is the, the I don't know, the, the basement or mm -hmm. the, the level one? Is it mm -hmm. the star? Mm -hmm. uh, it's just confusing. Yeah, so it's basically, it looks like uh, whoever put this in was like, ah, damn it, we don't have a one anymore but we don't want to get another one, but we have this star. So just put the star in there. People will get what it is anyways. So yeah, and kind of the, the how the layout of the numbers work is a little bit weird. So we are starting from the top left, which is at least in European countries, uh, also in America, the, the reading direction, and we have 31 there, then we go 32 on the right, but there's a gap in between. Then we have 29 below there, 30, which is okay, 26. And then suddenly we have a third, uh, basically, column, which then have 27, 28, and so on. And then we go down to four. And then suddenly it continues below there with three and two and the star. So there's not really a common thing in there. So there, there's not really a, a followed pattern in there that people can, can find there. And Additionally, when you uh, go into the other elevator that is in your building, you basically are presented with this then in comparison to this. And just to, just to these, are, these are actually elevators in one building. I think it was the Park Hotel in San Francisco. So uh, where somebody of my colleagues uh, made this photo in there. And again, what you can see on the other side, so we now even have, them, have a mismatch between the two. So suddenly the star, which apparently is level one or the ground floor or whatever is on the top. And then we have one, two, three, four. Also the text, the warning text or the instruction test text is uh, now at the top, which was previously at the bottom. Yeah, so, and then again, we now basically go in descending order from one, two, three, four. Then again, we have jumped to the five and it's just a mess. And this is pretty simple. And you probably, as the person who said, yeah, I hire somebody to uh, basically put in the numbers or the correct button layouts in our elevators, you kind of expected them that they know what you mean with this. So in the simple task, you expected the other party in your kind of design work that they know what you mean with the correct button layout. However, this usually is an issue, especially when communicating between different parties in a project. And this is why HCI design patterns might be necessary. And so we do another quick in-class exercise here where Let's say again, you are in an inter interdisciplinary, inter interdisciplinary design project. 
and you're a software developer working on a new software project. And I would ask you now to list all other disciplines, professions, stakeholders that you think will need to involve as part of your team. And to just make this easy, just write all of them into the chat. So everything that you think is involved in such a project, every, every other stakeholder, person, that's no, okay. <laughs> that's okay. You can put them all in the chat. You can do it live now. So whatever you are, you are come up with, uh, just write it in the chat for a minute. I basically observed it, but just let's do a quick rundown. We have things like marketing, distribution, management, of course, <laughs> user experience designer, users, graphic designers, the product owners, which can also be shareholders or people that kind of finance the whole project. Uh, product owners, uh, so this were the product owners, uh, clients, customers, the programmers, which have to implement whatever, for example, the designers come up with. Um, we could have software developers from outside of the actual project team. So we could have external software developers, uh, the people that write the documentation, the people that do service afterwards for the thing. And of course, then UX research and stuff like this. So already in this list, we could have another thing like uh, we could have project managers in there. We could have, uh, as we said, shareholders and stuff like this. Can have a whole support base around this. We have lawyers that might follow up the process or um, basically advise us on um, IPs and stuff like this. So intellectual properties. Then we have usually a whole business and marketing and economics team, which kind of does the, we have a team that does the advertisement for us. So as you can already see on such a smaller project, which is just the implementation of a software, we already have a huge amount of different stakeholders. And to basically put this in a graphic, we usually could have something like users talking to something what's called a master architect of customer experience or so customer person or customer service person. And then we have the developers there. And usually users tell the customer service that something does not work. And then the customer service has to forward this to the developers to, for example, in something like a bug report to then ask them to fix the bug, implement whatever they're doing. So we have this communication there. And this communication can have challenges. And these challenges can usually be something that like different values. So with this meaning that, for example, in this project, researchers are always interested in the valid truth of their data. And then they're like, uh, they're saying, okay, something does not work, something does work. But the business people are, for example, interested in making money out of the project. So they are challenging the data and saying, okay, can we maybe look deeper into this, whether this is actually something, because for example, I don't know, the research team together with the marketing team find out that um, an advertisement campaign did not provide the actual uh, increase in sold um, copies of the software or something like this. And then the business team gets mad about this and basically says, yeah, but we need to increase the, 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 the basically generation of value in the project. But then the designers say, no, but we actually, we want to build the best product for our users. And the users don't even know what their actual best product is. So we need to do, put more research into this. And what you see there is basically the different shareholders can have different values or different expectations around the project. So company, so marketing team usually is interested in making good contain, campaigns to basically acquire more customers. But for example, the customer service team says, well, when we get more customers, we also need to do more customer service and therefore we need more people. And then again, you have a conflict of interest there. Then usually there's the thing that's called respect, which often unfortunately is challenged in reality between different teams. So for example, programmers usually disliking the economics team because they're like, yeah, well, they uh, have no idea what, they, what they're supposed to do anyways. They're just telling us, I don't know, put more or restrict more of the software behind a paywall because we actually want to basically get more money out of it. 
and they might have the good intention to, for example, hire more people for the developer team, but the developer team just sees, oh, well, they're just giving us more work. So now we also have to implement this, this payment system around it, have to uh, develop restrictions, have to see that people cannot have work around, around this payment systems to maybe access something in the system that the users were not supposed to access or something. So, and with this comes basically respect for the other trade. So with this meaning that stepping back a moment, not always assuming that the others mean bad for you, but saying, for example, that a marketing team has a certain goal that they have to fulfill. A programming team also have to have the certain goal. And therefore, these teams probably need to align these goals and see in the end that they can have mutual respect for each other's work. And there's also a difference in methods. So for example, a programmer seeing that, uh, I don't know, um, whenever they, they put in this button and then they see that nobody clicks this button correctly, they say, ah, oh, stupid user. Then there comes the user experience designer who has the method of asking the user and the developer tell, tells them, no, we don't need to ask the users because I already know what's good for the software and so on. Or maybe you have a management that does not understand what, I don't know, the UX researcher want to do because they're saying, well, why do, should we need to put so much money into doing, for example, um, usage scenarios, personas and stuff like this, when we already know who our customer user base is, or when we already think that we know who our customer user base is. So we have all these different pain points with different um, basically participants in the, for example, development process in a project having different values, having differences in respect of each other's work, and using different methods where usually the other party does not really understand these message, uh, methods. And this is also where, as for example, as a UX designer, which is usually also a UX researcher, you need to sometimes guide this communication because you are usually the person in between, for example, the person between uh, project management and developers, the, usually the things that you come up with means that developers have more work to do. So there's usually also a huge challenge in communicating with developers on that the things you are um, recommending are basically val valuable for the team. And the same goes usually for the business administration around it because they need to provide you the money for your UX research and so on. So and this is basically when you as a UX researcher are working in a company, because most companies also have a research and development apartment where you as a UX researcher can also work in. So even if you want to do research outside of university, you can do so. And this kind of brings us to design pattern where we want to find methods or techniques to kind of streamline this communication process. So to come up with things to make this communication between different parties in whatever context we have easier. So this basically then means, or ask the question, what is the design pattern? And for this, we have a definition in here, which basically says a design pattern describes a successful solution to a recurring contextualized design problem in a consistent format that is readable by non-experts and networked into a language. And we will basically look at all these different parts in detail now, but let's just try with this text here to dissect it a little bit. So first of all, let's start with the design pattern describes a successful solution. So with this meaning, that this is something that has been tested beforehand. So for whatever you're communicating is something that is a tested and basically successfully tested method. So if I, for example, tell you um, for your research, you can use grounded theory or you can use qualitative analysis. These are, these are both methods that have been used beforehand 
successfully. And therefore, they are basically successful methods that we can use in a design pattern. And then to a recurring contextualized design problem, which again means that this is something that does not only happen once, because then usually we need to have an individual solution for it. And we need to sit down as a team and come up with this individual solution. But in fact, in this term, it is a recurring problem. So something that happens often. So for example, again, if you go to what, what, all the things that I said today, when you are probably doing qualitative research a lot of time as a qualitative researcher. So when I tell you that you should use interviews as a method in your qualitative research, again, I'm using something that has already been successfully used beforehand, but it's a solution to a recurring problem. The problem being, I want to get information about something out of the participants that, for example, participate in my user study or in my study in general. And then in a consistent format, meaning that now we basically need to describe this um, consistently. So basically having a format in which we frame these design patterns. And this is something that you will see later. I don't know whether still today, but at least next week that design patterns actually have quite a format. They, for example, might have a title, then they have an image of whatever you are describing, then they have a context about it, then they have, um, let's say, an instruction on how to apply whatever you are um, communicating with this, with this design pattern. Then a really important thing is that it is readable by non-experts, because this is kind of the whole thing that we are trying to solve here. So all these people in our project for which we want to use design patterns to have them communicate with each other might be experts in their unique domain. So for example, the programmers know a lot about coding. The marketing team knows a lot, knows a lot about advertisement and stuff like this, but they might not be expert in whatever area or domain the topic is going to communicate in. For example, if we are talking about architecture or going back to the how to do a correct button layout in an elevator, the people who are applying the buttons or putting in the buttons might not know how a correct layout works. But if you basically have a design pattern that is, I don't know, called correct button layout for a 50, 50 store building, then this is something that you can give them. So you can tell them, hey, can you uh, please apply the button layouts? Um, I have put this here in a format for you. So you just need to follow this format and that's it. So you don't need to have another meeting. You don't need to have another uh, basically instruction on them or tell them more than just apply the button layout 50 store building to the elevator. And they can now look into it and basically don't have, yeah, you need to follow this really comprehensive guide about how to do button layouts first. So for example, we tell them some terms that you have might heard about in DS1, like, I don't know, apply the 10 golden rules of design there. And they're like, I don't know what the 10 golden rules is. So instead you're giving them the format in a way like the buttons should start in a numbered order and always go from top left where the one is to bottom right where the, I don't know, 50 is if we have a 50 store building and go in one, two, three, four, five and at best to even have a picture of it. So ju they just need to follow the picture and you can be sure that it's basically what you expected them to do. So it needs to be readable even by, ex by people who are not expert in the domain where the pattern is residing in and networked into a language, which basically always also means that it's kind of structured. So there is kind of a certain language behind a, uh, a pattern, which doesn't mean that language not meaning, and this is really important because there's something that happened a lot in previous assignments and lectures, uh, and sorry, um, exams. It does not mean whether it's German, English or Spanish or whatever this meaning that it's the formatting language of it. That's for example, a specific grammar is used or something like this. 
And it's usually just that it for, follows the formatting that's pre previously used. Sorry, also not, not grammar. It's basically just always around the formatting of how to use it. It's better and easier to understand later with the examples. With this being, let's look a little bit into the history of design patterns because they have been utilized quite a long time already. <clears throat> so with one of the first recorded um, design patterns being this one here. And this is uh, basically during the Renaissance time where architecture kind of flourished. And they also find the issue that um, to communicate architecture better, we need to communicate what we actually mean with certain things. So the so-called master builders in this case structured their architectural knowledge about this. And what these usually contained were sketches plus text plus um, building information. So as you can see on the left, you have kind of a sketch about it. And then you have the text that explains it. And you also have another sketch on the right. What this is missing yet is basically the whole um, structured formatting. So this is so far just a text with pictures. But what we already have here, we already have this text with pictures. So it's not that the, um, basically the architects always sat down with the builders or with each others. And we're like always from the beginning telling what they mean with it, but they began with, okay, I have this document here on what my general idea is. I can first of all, give this document to other architects to communicate my ideas there, or also give the document to the architect builders. And again, these had to be proven solutions. Like they have already tested this beforehand. They have tested that this worked. I uh, usually, these were recurring design problems. I think this one here is about um, how to basically move uh, water up a level. So you can see like this, this structure here that kind of moves the water up here into there. So we basically move water a level if I remember it correctly. And then we should have this consistent format, which of course, with this being one of the first iterations is not already there here, but we already have this, that at least such a text should contain an image of whatever you're envisioning to communicate it easier to people, and then a text explaining it to you next. And basically the imagery also goes into that it's readable by non-expert because I can talk to you a lot about how to use water in a circular motion to uh, basically elevate at one level, but it gets way easier, easier if I just show you a picture of the thing and you're basically going like, ah, okay, now I understand. And this is one of the earliest examples of such patterns. So then we basically also have that this now goes into a history of literary forms and this being called a new literary form next to, for example, stuff like poems, newspaper, encyclopedias, letters, and novels. And this basically then is a new communication medium or new structure of a communication medium for human to human communication. That's also pretty, uh, pretty uh, important here. We're not structuring something to communicate it to computers, we structure something to communicate it to other people and we basically now add pattern to, patterns to it. And one of the first books or basically one of the books where this became very present in or was kind of taken into the modern architecture sphere was a book called A Pattern, Pattern Language by Christopher Alexander. And this was basically about urban architecture. So this was now 77, 40-ish years ago, more. <laughs> And uh, basically it was still used in the, uh, in the late eighties and stuff like this. And it's basically the one book that made patterns kind of usable in the modern-ish era. And which also basically made other 
usage domains aware of it. So this book actually contained 253 patterns and we will also look into one of these patterns. And um, it also introduced this first pattern language. So how to structure or how to format such a book correctly. And this then later served as an inspiration to software engineers. So let's look a little bit into what this meant. So we take a closer look into the domain of architecture and why patterns are interesting here and how can we translate this, for example, to HCI later or HCI research. So we have something, for example, um, with urban architecture, meaning architecture used in small cities or larger cities, so basically cities. And what we have there is, for example, this quote, a building or town is given its ex character essentially by those events that keep on happening there most often. So we now try to work our architecture around this events and space characters. So for example, what you can see is that uh, there's this uh, famous walkway in Tokyo where we always see uh, a huge amount of people traversing the space. And this was a set challenge when this was designed. But then we also have, um, for example, these uh, known sidewalk vendors in the city Mumbai and Bombay. And all these things, might be where people utilize a space without it being known to the designers of the space beforehand. So this was a challenge when coming up with these with these uh, uh, with these architectural challenges beforehand. So for example, people use these walkways now to not only walk there but to park. In this case, for example, cook there, eat, sleep. So we have different new challenges here that we might, for which we might find solutions. And these are now these recurring problems that we have in these spaces. So we now are trying to find the solutions for these, these tested solutions. So, and then we basically have these patterns of event and space. And what Alexander basically introduced here was, was a term that he called Quan, <laughs> which basically is, the quality without the name. And I personally think that's a beautiful thing because this is basically also what in UX, whether it's research or design, we are looking for. And it's basically the same in architecture. That usually if things work well, you cannot really discern why they work well. They just feel correct and they just feel like they are doing or they, they are working with your intentions. And usually, being the same issue as with UX, that usually you can only, you can never really value the presence of good UX design or good architecture, but you usually immediately pick up when it's done badly. So you can only basically understand the absence of uh, good design in this case, in both architecture and UX design. Okay, yeah. And basically, what he also, um, introduced into this is that this quality usually come up by observing inhabitants uh, how they use or utilize these um, different situations. So in this case, for example, creating walkways, which are kind of nice flat areas that you can walk on, but also afterwards people finding out, hey, these are also nice areas where we can set up our small, small, small shop there because you kind of have always people walking in there. It's a nice flat area where I can put, put my stovetop on there and cook something for people. Uh, this is something where usually also people can see that we are outside here anyway. So why not just meet there and have a community meeting or something like this? And this is what we usually also use in participatory design. <laughs> so kind of introducing the user into the actual design space. So if you remember this, we covered this already in DS1, that in our design process, we might include users to get more insight into them and also have this um, basically 
stronger impression about what they act want to actually do. Of course, you then also as a designer always need to filter this a little bit more because in the end, we're always saying users are not designers, but you basically get immediate feedback to whatever you are using or whatever you're envisioning. And therefore, participatory design can be a good way to have strong, fast um, iterations in the design process. And then basically to find solutions for these issues. So we basically have that people like to gather in front of their houses on the walkway to kind of interact with each other, to maybe cook something, to maybe introduce other to whatever what they're doing. So apparently there was a lot of interaction happening beforehand with people on the walkway. And with this basically then coming to the first pattern, which I would also use to close the lecture for today, being the porch <laughs> or the front porch of a building. And this is something where now basically when I tell you, I want to build a front porch, I hope I pronounced this correctly, <laughs> into, my, into my home, usually everybody involved will know what it is because this is kind of this established thing that has a certain or that has some certain properties involved around here. And it's kind of the solution that came up from how people were using walkways beforehand and our architects looking into, can we somehow include this in our design? And so what makes a pattern here is that we have these essentials around it. So for example, a porch <laughs> being, raised above the street level. So as you can see here, we have a small walkway on top of it. So you can observe people better. It's still open. So it's not closed to, uh, to your, so basically it's not closed behind it. So you have a presence there, but it's separated from the walkway now by being a little bit elevated. Maybe you have a small fence around it, as you can see here, but it's still open. So it still invites you to interact with, with whomever is on the walkway and invites the people on the walkway still to invite with the people sitting there because we have this open space between them and basically this possibility for communication. Then it's deep enough for people to sit comfortably. Again, we have the goal with that people can relax there, that people can go there after their work, for example, and there's just have, for example, a small chat with somebody. So people can also come up there, be invited into the space, sit down with you, and then observe whatever uh, was ever is happening. And then, but still, for example, bad weather or something, you have a roof on top that is usually supported by columns. And some non-essential part can that it has a certain height, it has a certain color, color, it has a certain material and how it connects to the inside with here, for example, the simple door. And with this being that basically by, by telling somebody or you now as somebody who wants to build a building, go to an architect, you as somebody who even does not know a lot of architecture, you can tell them, at my house, I want to have a front porch in front of it. And they immediately know, ah, okay, so you want something that has an open space in front of it, comfortable area to sit, and basically can introduce interaction between the people on the walkway and you. And you're saying, yeah, sure. And this basically makes the whole communication with the non-expert and the expert now easier by establishing these design patterns here, by establishing a structured format and a structured pattern of how, what basically you want to communicate. And with this, basically, I'm handing over to Professor Borges next week, closing up for today, and hope that I can still <laughs> tell you, or uh, I was still able to tell you comfortably what uh, design patterns are. So let me stop the sharing. So with this, we are done for the lecture for today. Uh, if you still have any questions around it, I will stay here for five minutes or something, but otherwise we will see each other tomorrow at the lab and then next week again. So I wish you a nice evening or a nice afternoon, not yet, <laughs> we do not have evening yet, and otherwise a nice week until next week. Bye-bye.
This content was provided by RWTH, Aachen University.